and also to the Na'iwi Maori, the Tangata Wehi of Awaturea. I would like to acknowledge that here at City East Campus of the University of South Australia, I'm on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. So as we get started, I invite you to share in the chat where you're calling in from. What we're all here for this evening, afternoon, depending on where you're coming from, and I do appreciate that for most people it's out of hours, so I do want to say thank you for that. The Repositories Group of the Australian Scholarly Communications Community of Practice is exceedingly pleased to present this session uh, by Sally Rumsey, the Coalition S Ambassador. Uh, we wanted to understand uh, the metadata and as opposed to mandated versus nice to have in regards to institutional repositories and Plan S. Uh, so once we've done that, there'll be the time for discussion and questions. To introduce Sally, uh, Sally Rumsey was until July 2022, JISC's open access expert working as support for Coalition S in all areas covered by Plan S, especially the Plan S rights retention strategy. Prior to that, she was the head of scholarly communications at RDM at the Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford. There she managed the university's repository service for research outputs, the Oxford University Research Archive known as Aura and also Aura, Aura Data. She was previously the e-services librarian and manager of the repository at the London School of Economics. And I think she's very pleased to say has now mainly retired. So whenever you're ready, Sally, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thank you for the welcome. And hello everybody, wherever you are, at whatever time you're at. I'm just trying to share my screen here. Let's do that. And that. Now, hopefully somebody will give me a thumbs up that you can actually see my slides here. Yes, we can. Great, excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation to uh, talk to you. I hope uh, by the end of the session, you'll feel a bit more clear on things than you perhaps do at the start. So here we are. First of all, just a little bit of um, background for um, about Coalition S. Sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of this thing on my screen there. Good. Um, so Coalition S is um, a group of 28 research funding organisations across the world. There are national funders, um, a quite a long list and growing list. We've had a few new recruits. Uh, there's the European Commission. And there's um, a group of charitable foundations such as the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation that are part of the coalition. And there's a global dimension to it with people such as the World Health Organization. These funders um, spend about 35 billion euros a year in research funds, and that results in about 150,000 articles a year. So it's, it's pretty sizable. Oh dear, what's happened there? To be clear, though, Plan S, which is the um, the the um, is the output of the of the, the sort of purpose of the group, I suppose, is not a policy in itself. It's a set of ten principles, and with those ten principles, there is guidance on its implementation. And each of the funders in the coalition implement these ten principles in a sort of coordinated way, but in their own way, but it's all aligned with the, um, the principles of, of Plan S. So they're all going in the same direction, but they might not all do it in exactly the same way. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, there is a strong principle underlying Plan S that basically um, all the scholarly publications that are a result of the research funded by those funders must be published open access, either in a journal or on a platform or via a repository without an embargo, that's the important thing, and under um, an open license, a CC BY license. So it's very clear, it's immediate open access. And there are three routes to compliance. The original Plan S was very much a sort of gold, gold open access type route. 
in that it was um, publishing in open access venues, uh, such as an open access, fully open access journal. And this is this can be financially supported by the funders. Um, equally, you can publish in a journal which is a subscription journal, but with an open access option. Um, but this is only supported with funding from the funders if it's under a transformative arrangement. That, um, that type of journal is sometimes called a hybrid open access journal. And then the, the, the area where we're focusing on today is what we call route two, the subscription journals, where authors publish in a subscription journal, but they make a version, either the version of record or the accepted manuscript immediately available in a repository. Just a, a side note on hybrid open access, um, Coalition S has taken a very strong position on hybrid open access. Um, I commend you to read this, this uh, piece online that they have published on the reasons why they are, are not keen on hybrid open access. And APCs, the article processing charges in hybrid journals is not financially supported by Coalition S funders unless that journal is part of a transformative arrangement because of the reasons um, um, given in the article. But it's worth noting that Coalition S has confirmed that it's going to end its financial support for open access um, publishing under transformative arrangements after 2024. So given that, if that funding is stopping, which it is, um, repositories could in the future play a more prominent role. So let's start taking a bit of a closer look at the metadata requirements, the technical requirements, I should have said, of Plan S for repositories. The requirements are published on the technical guidance and requirements on the Plan S website there under um, part three, and there's a list there of requirements for open access repositories, but you probably all know that anyway, because that's why you're here. Uh, the first requirement is that a repository must be registered in open door or in the process of being registered. And the reason for this is to indicate some um, quality and validity of that repository. The open door uh, service is run by JISC or the Sherpa section of JISC and it's a global directory so it's not just a UK thing. The entries in it are reviewed before they are accepted and because of this it's a trusted service so any, any repository listed there can be deemed to be a trusted repository. The second um, requirement uh, this is the, the mandatory requirement, is that of a persistent identifier for the deposited version in the repository. So each deposited item should have a unique identifier. Now, the type of identifier isn't prescribed by Plan S, and the choice of that remains with the repository. But um, what it should be is a, um, a recognized standard identifier, not just something you made up on a Tuesday afternoon. The idea is that you can aim towards versioning, but you know it's accepted that that's not something that many repositories do actually uh, support at this moment. But underlying all of this, and I'm going to say this quite a lot in this presentation, is the idea that both the repository and the content in it, it all is aiming towards the quality and trustworthiness that the repository is aligning with best practice that it's interoperable with other services and for the purpose of um for the serving the academics whose works it, it holds that discovery is easy and or as easy as possible there the repository is going to be there for some time and it's properly supported so that's underlying all of these requirements For the next, oh dear, sorry, it keeps jumping around here. Uh, for article level metadata, the detail of the metadata is left again to the repository. Um, but the idea being that the metadata used to describe 
the items in there will conform with common standard formats, again unspecified. The elements within the metadata for the items should include um, the DOI of the version of record, the publisher's version, again, the PID of the deposited version, the status, the open access status of the item, and information about the funder and the grant there, if possible. And the aim of this is to, again, maximize the discovery, use and dissemination of the items that are in that repository. I mean, we're talking about the funded items here, but this applies to all items in the repository, I would have thought. The metadata for the items should also be available under a, a, an open license so that that again can be out there and reused. The fourth requirement is the open access state, statement and license and the metadata should include something that describes the open access statement uh, the open open access status of the item and the license of that deposited version. Now then if the repository is not able to embed that within the article, then it should be within the item record or web page uh, metadata of that item. And again, in um, a non proprietary machine readable format. Coming back again to this whole idea of discoverability and persistence and sustainability and so on. Then we've got continuous availability. Now, I'm assuming this is what repository managers want anyway. You don't want a broken repository that's down, you know, more time than it's up. The aim is towards maximum uptime. And, you know, if you compare it to other services within your institution, you would want it, I assume, to be um, comparable to or better even than other services within your institution. Um, if for some reason the service does go down, then um, to provide helpful information for anybody encountering it, either to deposit or to try and find items within it. As you know, you might put down uh, when the service, you expect the service to be back in full operation. I mean, as, as far as I'm aware, this is what good repository managers do anyway, so this shouldn't be news to you. And finally, um, having a help desk so that people can submit queries, particularly depositors, um, the solution, again, is left to the individual repository. Uh, the idea is that anybody submitting a query can get a prompt response. Now, that immediate response could just be a holding note saying, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Or, you know, we'll get back to you before Tuesday or something, whatever. Um, but the idea being that you don't just leave people in limbo. Again, this is something which I, I think repository managers would want to provide anyway. Now, I've just listed the, um, the recommended uh, requirements here, just on one list, one short list, because they are recommended, they're not mandatory. Those, it's summarized, are um, that the repository should have a convenient means that an individual item can be uploaded to the repository and that there can be bulk uploads as well. I think, again, if you haven't got a convenient single item <laughs> a service for your repository, well, you might as well pack up and go home really before you've started. Um, there's a requirement uh, here for machine readable full text, but it's acknowledged that most repositories are not going to be able to do that um, at this moment in time. You know, it's a sort of nice to have, really. Um, the next requirement I think is perhaps more likely the use of other standard persistent identifiers. So many repositories already are using ORCIDs for authors as a sort of standard identifier that is you know a global solution. Maybe it's not perfect, maybe there are uh, you know not everybody likes it, but it's as good as we've got for the moment. There are increasing other identifiers which are becoming standardized, such as those for funders and for institutions. And as these um, become more common, this is something that repositories I expect will want to pick up anyway, because it helps everybody in trying to find 
and sort and, and deal with items in the repository. It would be nice to have um, citation data using the I4OC standard there. Um, again, that's not something that repositories might be doing yet, but you know, something to aim for. Um, an open API, that's something that you may already have, um, I would think. And uh, if you've got one, great. If you haven't got one yet, well, you know, something to work towards. The original Plan S had this, um, this requirement for open air compliance. Now, that is very much a European Commission focus, which, especially talking to you good people at the other side of the world, might not be at the top of your list. But if you're not going to um, comply with open air uh, requirements, then you might like to take a look at it and aim for some alternative similar guidelines because it's a, a good thing to do anyway. And finally, um, where feasible, uh, you can use standard formats and protocols to enable your metadata to be harvested by aggregators. Again, this is all about discovery and findability and so on of the content in your repository. So it's something that you probably want to do anyway. And just to keep a, a good watch on who the aggregators are that uh, you would like to participate with and make sure your repository meets their requirements. So underpinning again all of this, it's this idea of quality and interoperability, sustainability and so on. I'd just like to flag up this tool if, uh, in case anybody hasn't come across it. It's run by the Open Door people. It's a self-assessment tool so that you can judge how far your repository meets the Plan S technical requirements. Now, you'll be pleased to know that should you choose to um, have an entry for your repository in here, it's not made public. It's purely for your use so you can gauge just how far you meet those requirements so it's not the idea is not it's a naming and shaming tool it's for your benefit to see where you are and where you might like to put in some effort as you uh, develop your repository further there is quite a lot of practical advice on the requirements um, <clears throat> on the plan s website, I know, because I wrote it. Um, and here it's trying to sort of explain in a little bit more detail about those requirements and where perhaps there's a bit more flexibility um, in how and when you might um, apply some of and adopt some of the requirements in your repository. There in addition to that, there are some FAQs. Again, they're built on that practical advice there, but you might find answers to a few questions there if there's something <clears throat> that you haven't come across in the other help on the um, Plan S website. So just looking more broadly, this is very much the guiding star for you that as far as the repository technical requirements go, Coalition S has left much of the detail down to others to make because it's not pretending to be um, a sort of advisor on technical details or as something developer of specifications or anything like that. It's leaving these detailed decisions up to the people who are working in the field and who know about this stuff. So the idea being that it's common standards and, and global um global practices that will come into being. So through the usual channels, such as the standards bodies and joint projects and so on, so that everybody's working together on these. It's like ORCID, you know, ORCID has become the sort of de facto uh, identifier for authors and the community has come together to recommend that. And some final thoughts just to finish off just reiterating that Coalition S funders are not standard specification designers. So a lot of the decisions of the detail is left up to you as repository managers and owners. The technical aims are there to try and promote this quality, trustworthiness, interoperability and sustainability. I'm expecting all of you are thinking, yeah, tick, 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 we, we want all of that. 
and you will be aiming towards those things anyway. So it's the, the technical requirements are just designed to underpin those aims. Um, the idea is that with the um, advice that we've put up there, these are pragmatic solutions, recognising where something might at the moment be perhaps an ask too far for a repository. But it might be something that you would think, yeah, in an ideal world, we're working towards that. That's what we want as well. So thinking of, of the uh, advice there in the sort of spirit of the law and aiming towards these very, very high standards. So this is why um, Plan S is not over prescriptive. It's allowing the whole area to evolve and change. And we've seen an awful lot of this um, with all the technologies evolving very quickly. Scholarly dissemination itself is evolving very quickly. We're seeing many, many new methods of sharing research findings. You know, um, 10, 15 years ago, people were not sharing sort of protocols and um, they were sharing preprints, but they might not be share have been sharing micro publications or other things which we're now beginning to see um, in on other platforms. So things like the Notify project, um, I don't know if anybody's taken a look at that, well worth a look if you haven't, run by the Coalition of Open Access Repositories, um, Kathleen Shearer there, and the peer community in people. It's, it's a way of um, publishing work, not in the traditional way, but with open peer review in, in other, on other platforms. These sorts of things are, are getting legs. And so we need to recognize that. There may be new standards coming on board, things which we haven't even thought of yet, new technologies. So having the, the requirements being a little loose, and not too prescriptive, means that these sorts of things can evolve and the standards still meet them in some ways. And Coalition S itself is moving with the times. As I mentioned before, it started off when it first launched in 2018. I remember seeing this myself and thinking, yikes, that's a, that's a, a gold uh, policy if ever I saw one, sorry, gold principles if ever I saw one. But very quickly it moved to this idea that um, both the gold route, the, you know, the publishing open access route and the green repository route to, act, uh, to, um, to open access are equally valid. And they recognize that very clearly now. And if you haven't already seen it, I commend to you the recent consultation report of Towards Responsible Publishing. Coalition S is keeping its eyes very much on the distant horizon. It's not standing still. And it's looking now towards where scholarly dissemination is going with this sort of publish, review, curate model. So if you haven't seen that report, um, well worth a read. And I shall leave it there. I think that's enough detailed in information from me and happy to take questions on any of this. Thank you, Sally. I found that a incredibly helpful, <laughs> even though it's not something I work with directly at the moment. Um, the refresh as well in regards to Coalition S and Plan S was particularly helpful for me as well. And I've just spent some time throwing the links in the chat for everybody. Um, does anyone have any immediate questions they'd like to unmute and ask? No? Yep. Okay. Yes, I've, I I've had a question. <laughs> yes, I have a I've question. I've just seen your hands. Sorry, yes, Paula, okay. I've, I've always got questions. Um, my question is around the PID for the accepted manuscript. Um, in some repositories, uh, you're only allowed to have one DOI. And as our system generally works with the research manager, uh, management system and the Office of Research, we use the DOI for the version of record in that space. Um, now, unfortunately, the repositories platform we're using, ePrints, um, doesn't actually use handles or allow a second DOI. Is that something that they've addressed in the UK in, in repositories? 
Um, people are using different DOIs. I mean, anybody using a DSpace uh, repository, I think DSpace, if I remember right, issued handles anyway, didn't it? So they would have handles automatically. Um, the repository that we had at Oxford was using UUIDs, so not DOIs. Um, some repositories have adopted a DOI system for, for um, adopting them for the accepted manuscripts as well. So I think you're going to find all different flavours in the UK. I mean, it just needs something permanent, you know, something persistent and permanent. So whatever you've got, if it's not sort of if it's not fully up to muster, if it's just a sort of um, something that can collapse sort of tomorrow, well, that's that's clearly not not desirable. And I think you would probably agree that that's not desirable for your repository anyway. So, yeah, um, whatever you can institute that you would consider to be sustainable and persistent and so on, then adopt that. You know, um, but there is a, a multi multiplicitude of is that a word of um, of of um, PIDs in the UK already, and people are just doing something which they believe to be um, to be persistent. I think there is a bit more of a move to adopt DOIs for accepted manuscripts in some circles. I mean, that was a decision we we took at Oxford not not to do that at the time. Um, but um, that is very much a decision for you as the repository manager or your, you know, your colleagues as repository managers to come up with something. And it doesn't matter if it's not a DOI. Thanks, Sally. Um, Zach. Curry has put a question in the chat um, and he, Sally, he was wondering if you've got any thoughts on the role of repositories or similar infrastructure uh, in the scenarios that are envisaged in the proposal towards responsible publishing? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I did mention the Notify project, which is small at the moment, but I think that the jury's out here, really. You know, it's a consultation document, so, you know, things are not yet um, set in stone. But as I say, Coalition S is removing the funding support for transformative arrangements. So I think we're going to see quite a big change come next year. And they are very much looking at this idea of publishing early and then, um, so like with preprints, and then um, having the peer review on top of that. Um, in many cases. So yes, definitely repositories could become much more, much more important um, for the Coalition S funders, and they are very open to that. Um, I think this is evolving so quickly that we could see quite a few new models there. I don't know if you've had a look at um, Octopus, which is a sort of um, platform doesn't suit everybody in every in every discipline, but it's a, it's a new way of publishing. It's not the only solution like that, but people are putting out much much more different um, item types there as you know as results of their findings. So yeah, repositories could be very much in um, in evidence. I think in the future. So yeah, get your repository ready. Sally, I had a follow up to that then. If early publication is being encouraged, plus peer review on top of that, and looking at the octopus model, does that mean that the requirements or the imperatives to have repositories or similar infrastructure with versioning is going to become more important? Don't know. <laughs> because, um, I mean, it's, it is evolving. And I, th I think... You know, the, re the requirements are not going to suddenly change overnight. That That's for sure. Plan S is not going to is not going to change overnight. So um, I think go go back to the fundamentals. It's immediate open access without embargo under an open license. And I think if you keep that as your guiding star, you know, then 
then you and meeting meeting um sort of common standards for how you do that i think that is that is what to keep at the front of your mind so at the moment we're you know we could blue sky thinking here at the moment where we think journal articles don't we they're the sort of be all and end all of research findings publication well you know who knows five years from now we might not be looking at the journal article as as the final arbiter of what what the research was about there might be all sorts of other things there so repositories are ready to step into the breach there at least in my experience because repositories have not just been putting journals there for ages i mean people are talking about open access books now aren't they quite a lot because they're coming more into the into the psyche through various uh, policies now you know repositories have been holding book chapters for as long as repositories have been going as to my knowledge and other things so repositories are perfectly placed to pick up all types of outputs from the institution. I think, yeah, I think this is something to, to think about as well. You know, we've been talking about compliance here, haven't we? And this is one of my, my sort of hobby horses, really. Try to get away from this idea of compliance because, yeah, you need to comply with your funder because they're, they're the ones providing the money and all that. But actually, what we're looking at is your institution having somewhere to have the corpus of, of research outputs of that institution. These are the crown jewels of your institution, remember, to keep them safely and where possible to make them out there, read, used, so that your researchers can get the credit that they need and your institution can get the, the credit that um, it needs. So try and get away from this idea of compliance as being the be all and end all. It's not about actually about compliance. It's about getting the stuff out there, keeping it stay safe and making sure people can find it. So I don't know where I'm going with this now, but <laughs> um, but the, the idea being that, um, that anything that Plan S does, anything that the funders do are trying to promote that rather than be a compliance rule for its own sake. Does that make sense? I mean, I'll say yes, but anyone else can jump in, jump in as well. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned book chapters and institutional repositories, uh, which I will get back to because I think Kayla has a question. No? Yes. Um, yes. Sorry. I'm just trying to find all the buttons. Um, yeah. So you were talking kind of about how Coalition S isn't mandating any specific way of using standards, which obviously makes perfect sense. Um, but of course, standards and ways of doing things are more useful when people are doing them in the same way. Um, you've mentioned a few different sort of communities of practice or standards that are useful for people to look into a bit more. I was just wondering if there are any ones that you think people might not have heard of or that we might be missing, but you think are really useful or or even just ones that you're like, they're doing a good job. You may already know about it, but yeah, just sort of what are your kind of ones to make sure people don't miss? Yeah, and I don't really like to highlight many really because, <laughs> you know, if I say one, then I'll have missed another and then there might be something growing up that's blossoming next year that, you know. So I think you want the standards for the item um, you know, to describe the atom, like, like the DOI, I'm just using that as an example, um, for the person. So um, something that um, can be a unique identifier for the author, authors, um, like ORCID. Um, something for the institution, and that's taking its time to sort of bed down a bit. It's quite complicated, I think, to do that. Um, but nonetheless, it's coming on stream. And um, then there's the uh, funder and, you know, things like funder ID and oh, whatever it's called this week, um, funder and the, the grant number. There aren't standards for grant numbers as far as I'm aware, but there are standard, uh, there's a sort of identifier for funders, which is around. So these are not universal yet, a lot of them. ORCID, I would say, is pretty global. But the others are not yet bedded down. But I would say, you know, keep your eye on the ball and pick up whatever seems to be getting legs, like the, the funder ID 
oh golly, it's changed its name, hasn't it? Um, something like that. And get a, a field in your repository where you can record something like this as soon as you can, because the more people that pick these things up, it's like ORCID, the more people that pick it up and use it, then the more useful it becomes. Um, so yeah, just keep your eye on the horizon. And there's the um, Research on Research Institute that's looking into a lot of this sort of stuff. So keep your eye on the bodies who are also keeping an eye on it, if that makes sense. Thank you for the question, Carol. Did you have a follow up? No, I'm all good. No. Thank you so okay. much for that. All right. Uh, speaking of um, identifiers, I've just thrown a link in the chat as well for the ARDC um, PID strategy work that's happening at the moment that will goes across multiple different areas in regards to PID or particularly for the Australian uh, contingent present. So that might be something else in regards to um, PIDs across the board, because I think there is a section on that that's looking at perhaps assigning PIDs to grants. Um, oh, so sorry. I'll throw um, just that's just reminded me and um, knowledge exchange have produced a very nice report on um, trust um, for for identifiers um, that's that might be something to direct people at um, because it's looking at how trustworthy are these identifiers you know how sustainable and so on so that's something that people might be interested in because that's always a question you know even DOIs could collapse one day you never know um, so yeah, that might be something that's um, that's of interest. Thank you. I've Sorry. just thrown that in the chat as well. I just found that. Um, okay, I had the next one. Um, next, before I I keep careening on in regards to my own questions, I can't see any hands, but I can't see all the names at the moment. Does anyone want to unmute and ask a question? No. Okay. Um, the other one I had was, oh, sorry, someone did. Yeah, that was me again. Sorry. Um, I have a question around um, the XML. Sally, do you think we've been um, focusing too much on PDFs in our repositories? So we have a lot of PDFs of accepted manuscript versions, but no XML versions. And I know that from the beginning, PubMed was uh, collecting XML versions. Do you think we need to start thinking about doing that? Ah. <laughs> well, if I turned around and said that all of you tomorrow have to be producing all your articles in XML, I think you'd all, <laughs> you'd all throw up your hands and go home. You? Um, no, I mean, yes, um, in an ideal world, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, is it really? Um, this, this, this discussion, I think, has been going since day one, and I think PubMed Central um, uh, doing it, um, you know, they've got an army of people doing it, I think, but that's not going to happen in repositories. So, yes, I suppose one would love to have that version as well with all the links in it and all the sort of um, enhanced text and everything, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. So I think we have to be realistic about that. Thank you, Paula. Any, I can't, still can't see any hands, I'm afraid. I clicked on something and um, gave myself a technical headache in regards to being able to see if there are hands up. No? Okay. Um, I did, I have a follow-up question in regards to talking about you referenced book chapters having been in institutional repositories for quite a long time now. Something that's come up in regards to the community of practice in the last couple of weeks has actually been the change to OUP policy around inclusion of book chapters in um, institutional repositories. Have you seen what OUP have had to say? Uh, okay. Um, let me see, last week, I think it was, or maybe between one and a half weeks ago, uh, basically they're saying our interpretation of it is that 25% of any manuscript, so instead of perhaps saying edited work and it's a chapter or 10% of that edited work can go in, so rule of thumb, one chapter is you know pretty much fine to put into an institutional repository, 
the wording now seems to indicate that it's going to be 25% of each manuscript can be made available in an institutional repository. So 25% of the book chapter. Mm. Um, so, but if you haven't seen it, you probably can't comment. Uh, no, I mean, my, my initial reaction to that would be rights, actually. Yeah. Comes down to your rights, doesn't it? Yeah. So, you know, if you sign up to that, then that's sort of what you're limited by. But if you... I mean, books, books are a tricky one because they, they are very much a, a different beast to an article, definitely. So I'm I'm very wary of sort of pontificating about this, um, with, you know, because it it is a tricky area. However, just off the top of my head, um, my feeling would be that if you are writing a chapter in an edited book, it's sort of similar to an article in that it's not a it's it, it's not a, a long form uh work it's probably longer than an article but it's not a long form work in the way that a whole book is right so um i would sort of argue that if you're writing a chapter in in an in an edited volume you would be well advised to hang on to your rights. Now then, if you're looking at rights retention policies now, for the most part, um, institutions that have adopted these sorts of policies have kept them fairly closely aligned to articles and conference papers. Most of them have got some sort of clause in there that allows them to either extend it to other output types or they already encourage people to use it on other output types. So I think I would be recommending with a policy like that, and this is this is why I've been so keen on the rights retention stuff, because I've been saying all along that we're using it for articles now, but as things change, you need to get that right for other item types as well, like preprints, like micro publication that whatever you're going to put out there you know get this embedded in that the rights belong to the author now for all item types so that as things change things change going down the line you know today it's oup tomorrow it'll be everybody else following suit won't it you know to get that embedded now so that you have the right to use your chapter as you want or the text of your chapter the content of your chapter as you want and, you know, I would have that argument now rather than trying to leave it, to be honest. Yeah, it was a bit unfair for me if you haven't seen that already. No, it's not because, it, I mean, it is, that is relevant. That is really relevant, you know, particularly when I start getting on my hobby horse about rights retention, because I think it's, you know, whoever writes this stuff, it's their right to own their rights, isn't it? You know, and that goes for any any output type, not just articles. And that includes book chapters. The one I think that's seen in the last couple of days that's been particularly relevant um, with rights retention is the, I think it was in May, Informa, which owns Taylor and Francis, um, signed a deal with Microsoft to make the content of what they called their advanced research, advanced education, something like that, um, available. You know, basically, they basically signed it all off and said that Microsoft can train their IA, I, AI on it um, and that suddenly started hitting um, some more general awareness in academic circles in the last couple of days um, and the rights retention has been bandied about with that in regards to this is why this is the case. I think the press release actually said that it was, um, they described it as, the publisher described it as our intellectual property <laughs> that they were making available to uh, to Microsoft for that training purpose, which um, fills me with horror personally, but that's my personal opinion. Um, but no, it's it's certainly becoming um, quite, uh, it's, it's in the public consciousness a bit more, I think, because of those kinds of things. Uh, Kayla, did you have a question? I did, and it actually follows on really well from what you were just talking about. Um, with the rise of generative AI, something that we've been thinking about in our repository, particularly around our 
digital student theses that are made available was people who having a lot of concerns about, I don't want AI scraping my things. Um, do you see the rise of this AI changing some of how Plan S framed stuff like open licensing or that ease of machine readability and openness? Does that make it harder in any way? Or is it something we just have to work around? I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that one, but it's kind of something we're balancing the open versus the, ah, then it makes big companies <laughs> money, so. Yeah, I mean, it, th this is a big question. I suppose you could spend three days discussing this, couldn't you? But I mean, um, as far as Coalition S goes, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but with with AI, I mean, I think there are a lot of discussions need to be had because, you know, talking about scraping Taylor and Francis's content, well, yeah, that's one thing, but artificial intelligence is being trained on certain outputs, isn't it? Uh, which means that it could be very biased. I mean, there are bigger brains than mine on this. I, you know, I'm, I'm very much <laughs> an onlooker from the sides of this, but, um, you know, we're, we're looking very much at um, northern, northern hemisphere outputs aren't we you know for training AI I suppose and so I think there are those sorts of discussions need to be had as well as the rights of the authors and you know and um, what gets picked up and what's trained on it but yeah th this whole idea of it's um the content doesn't belong to you and we can do whatever we like with it yeah rights absolutely front and center of all of that discussion yeah thank you Thank you, Kayla. Does anyone else want to jump in on that or no one's willing to <laughs> unmute and have something to say? <laughs> I can't see any hands. No, no one's willing to, <laughs> to open up that can of worms for themselves. Okay. Um, any additional questions then for Sally? I'm sure everyone's tired of me talking. Okay. Paula, did you have anything additional? Oh, I can usually find a, a couple of things I want to know. Hold uh, that thought then, because Arthur's just put something okay, in the chat. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, he asks, if you know of any examples where rights retention has been tested in the courts? No. Simple as that. <laughs> no. Okay. I, I don't think it hi Arthur, anyway. <laughs> um I don't I don't think it's been formally challenged anywhere, not to my knowledge. Yeah. Does anyone else have any examples that they know of since the question's been asked? No? I, I think actually. Um I think many um, many would welcome it being tested in the courts. Actually, <laughs> if I'm honest, I think perhaps um, it suits some uh, some parties that it's not tested in the courts. I mean, the the only thing I can think of is that thing where um, it was Elsevier and the ACS. Um, with ResearchGate, they took ResearchGate to court, didn't they? And there was a ruling, I think it was in Germany, where um, there were no damages awarded to Elsevier and ACS because they didn't think that the the rights had been properly determined, actually, that, yeah. So look, look that case up. It was Elsevier and ACS and ResearchGate, and it was about a few years ago now, yeah. Okay, if that's the correct one, I've just put it in the chat. Press release by ResearchGate saying ACS Elsevier and ResearchGate resolved litigation with solution to support researchers. So that probably doesn't have too many details of the case, if that's the correct one you're thinking about, Sally, but there is um, a release from ResearchGate that I've just put in the chat. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the right one. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, it just 
to me, that just smacks of just hang on to your rights, all of this. Then you can do what you like with your content. <laughs> I think that's probably, and I know it's been said before, uh, more complicated for various, some researchers in some disciplines as opposed to some disciplines in other, um, in other disciplines uh, in regards to uh, advancement and publication and all those kinds of things. Um, um, Paula, was, you had something Yes, else? I did. Yes, I was just going to ask Sally to comment on the, the UK strategy of not having to have the rights retention language on the manuscript before making it available. So as we know, uh, searching often in vain for a rights retention statement on a manuscript um, is constraining. Um, if we could just rely on the fact that this policy exists within our institution and just go ahead and act as if the, the um, statement was on the manuscript. Could you explain how some UK universities are doing that? Yeah, it, now I don't know how the law works in Australia, so you would need to look into your local jurisdiction. But in the UK, the way it's been dealt with is that um, if an institution has, accept, has um, adopted a policy of rights retention in the way that um, they've got an agreement with, with all their researchers, that they will give the repository a copy and the repository will make it open access. The way it's worked in the UK is that the institution has informed publishers of this policy being adopted so that publisher X, you know, so Smith and Jones Publishing over here has been informed that the University of Whitney has adopted this policy. Now, then that means that um, that in putting their articles in the repository and making and the university make remember it's the university making them available not the author yeah and um, the university making that available if the um publisher comes back and objects um or tells the author they can't more more the point tells the author they can't do that it's um what they call a, a, a oh I've forgotten the exact wording. It's on the tip of my tongue. Breach of contract. Um, it's sort of trying to get them to break break a contract which they already had, and the publisher knew that because they've been informed. You see, so in knowing that, they just need to know that the author is from that university. So, providing the author tells Smith and Jones that they're from the University of Whitney, the publisher knows that they are bound by that already stand existing contract with the university well not contract but that agreement with the university that they're going to do this so if they if the publisher says you can't they're trying to encourage them to break and they, and this this is the, this is the stance that the coalition s had with its rights retention strategy as well but the, the university one is much more powerful because it's like part of the employment contract that the author has with their employer. I mean, I should say, should stress there that these things are not usually imposed from the top down. They're done in agreement with the the researchers at that institution. So they've all agreed they're going to do this. They inform the publishers and the publisher basically hasn't got a le leg to stand on because it's it's an existing agreement, but they need to be informed. So that's okay. been one of the big, um, one of the big, um, actions that universities have had to take and they they all talk to each other so they've all been helping each other out with this and JISC is helping them as well in how how when and who to inform yeah and Coalition S did that as well it's also informed oh over 150 publishers right at the get-go to say we're doing this and this is a this is in the researchers um agreement with the funder it's already existing thanks Sally yeah. Yes. There's, a, oh, there's another a question in, in the um, chat there. Yes. So um, um, there's a comment that sounds like we'll need to shift your funding away from subscription scholarly 
publishing models and into repositories. I um, didn't think that that was the direction of Australia's chief scientist. I'm not sure if you've seen what the chief scientist here is looking to do. Basically, a nutshell, a national um, gold solution, effectively, um, which would provide access to anyone with a particular, um, possibly, uh, well, a YouGov account, basically. So uh, would be able to access uh, everything from whichever publishers sign up to it and would there would have then that open access availability, which I've just summarized exceedingly poorly. The question is, do you think a move towards the diamond model will solve rights retention as well as transferring cost away from researchers? I think um, I think uh, Australia might be well advised to look at the situation in the UK as far as adopting a, a gold model goes because that's what happened back in 2012 and the fact that it's shifting away from that now you know maybe is indicative of how well that went um and i think um the diamond model is an excellent model because it gets away from this whole instead of the author paying the um instead of the reader paying then the it falling on the author paying or the funder and it just gets gets rid of that. Now then, it's not without its problems, and it's a model that Coalition S is heavily promoting. But it is an ideal way to do things because it shifts that whole sort of where where the spend happens. Now then, it's not the only game in town. There are other other models as well, like subscribe to open, etc. There are all sorts of things cropping up, and I'm sure we will see many more in the in the coming. Uh, years. Um, so will will Diamond solve rights retention? Well, as a model, it's great because, yeah, generally, to my knowledge, um, any Diamond published art, um, journal tends to leave all the rights with authors. You have to be careful with this saying, leaving the rights with authors, because you know, you get this situation where a, a journal proudly says, you know, you keep your copyright, but then it's an exclusive license and they sign away all sorts of rights and and um, terms and conditions anyway. But, you know, um, what I'm trying to say is that um, with the sort of rights retention type thing, um, I think Diamond, I think um, pretty well always the, the rights remain with the with the authors. Um, so, yes. Um, and other models as well, like, like, as I've mentioned, the notify model, that's another one where the rights would, would remain with the author. Um, cost, I think this is where universities and funders need to have a long, hard look about how they divvy up their money. I mean, it has been going largely on um, APCs and all these sort of agreements, hasn't it? The, the, the lion's share of the money. But I think more and more institutions, I mean, the University of Oxford, as we were talking about earlier, Sarah, you know, they actually state in their, I can't remember the exact wording now, but in their thing that they've got online there, that it will give them the opportunity to look at other models and other ways of, of publishing. And remember that rights retention gives you a sort of, um, the ability for a, a plan B that you can walk away from a deal if it's, you know, when in the negotiations, it doesn't um, do what you want. So I think all these moves, um, you've said in, in the question about transferring cost away from the researchers, presumably that's paying a APCs is what's meant in the question. But yeah, I mean, the more we can make things easy for researchers, the better, so they don't, don't have to worry about the money as it were and it's sort of sorted out that that would be great yeah yeah so i mean at the moment i mean it's just a it's just a nightmare isn't it trying to negotiate all these different plans and things i do pity researchers and being bombarded with all this stuff when actually you know you just want to get on with your research um so yeah i i think the more that it can be made seamless like this and with these new models coming in i i think it is being made more seamless i mean that's not going to that's not to say that we won't have publishers um offering these other um apc type models and you know publishers need to be paid for the services that they offer that's that's well and good i'm not saying that publishers shouldn't be paid for them but they should but 
yeah, I think it needs to be simpler. Okay, that was incredibly helpful. Thank you. I threw in the chat the first thing I could find about the new, well, the incoming or updated policy uh, adox, but I don't think that's the cleanest link that I can find for that, but it was the fastest one I could find. Um, we have reached the end of time. Are there any last, last minute questions while we still have Sally? Okay, I can't see any hands. So that just leaves me to say thank you so much for giving up your time, uh, Sally, to talk to us. Uh, I'm very grateful on behalf of the repositories group and I'm quite happy to speak for Paula and Alicia with that. Um, it has been exceedingly helpful and uh, I hope it has been useful for everyone who has been present. And the only thing is to say good afternoon and good evening to everyone on the call. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you all.